call as we get this set up. And uh, we're using the auto technology in the, in the Poly uh, R3 Great. camera. Great. How are you doing today, Paul? I'm good, David. How are you doing? I'm, I'm terrific. Paul, introduce yourself to people who may not know you. I'm Paul Erickson. I am the founder and principal of Erickson Strategy and Insights, which is consultancy that I set up uh, to go independent after almost 20 years of being an industry analyst for a lot of notable companies like IHS Market, Omdia, Parks Associates, and MPD Display Search. And this is probably my 15th CES. Very nice. Uh, so I'm a veteran, much like David. And David, I, I, I can't remember the last time I saw you in person. Was it four years ago, maybe? Oh, it had to be ago? longer than that. It had to be, you know, probably at an Infocom going back 10, 12 years Infocom. in person. Wow. I mean, wow. we've seen each other a lot. Yes, I know, I know. It's the world that we're in now. Did, did I run into you at ISC four years back? I don't know. Well, definitely Infocom in Orlando, I think. Yeah, well, you know what? The truth of the matter is you get to a certain age in the industry when your <laughs> hair is this color and you have, yes. to, you have to tint your beard that more people know you than you know. Yes. And so I don't remember everybody that I run into, but I always smile and shake hands and, and do that. So so we were at CES, being honest, we're recording this on, what the heck day is it? Wednesday. Yes. Um, this is media day two, technically. Day one was yesterday. We've already been through a bunch of press conferences today. I was at the 8 a.m. LG conference. Panasonic had their conference. Bosch had their conference. And and one of the things that came up, and I do want to talk to you about this, um, we're starting to see a lot of ESG, environmental social governance, being talked about um, at the conference. Instead of throwing around the buzzwords that were here for last year's shorter show and smaller show and the year before we were all digital, we were metaverse and blockchain and NFTs and crypto. Those, those They're still there, but they're sort of like under a blanket sideways. Everybody's talking about sustainability, diversity and inclusion. Um, uh, the, the, the ESG, all these pieces, and they're taking it seriously. Right. We were talking before about you know how important it is uh, for, for retention of employees and recruiting employees, how important it is when you're trying to sell to a company, how sustainable your products. It looks like after many years of just babbling about it, the industry is now finally taking sustainability seriously. They are. Uh, and it is refreshing to see you know the commitment from – it could be as fundamental as uh, – let me back up. I was going to say – Versus some of the grander efforts that you see played out in, you know, what's spoken about in terms of how companies are changing policy and what they're doing in manufacturing. Uh, sometimes I like to look at the uh, commitment to a certain initiative by looking at how, at the smallest levels, like how are you seeing this permeate a company's products or culture? And it could be as simple as looking at Samsung's remote controls that are, you know, solar recharging, you know, in, in different ways where companies are committing R and D. They're committing. They're committing spend towards not just the implementation um, of you know, not just towards being a better company in terms of sustainability, DEI, um, governance, ESG. Not just at the corporate level, cultural level, cultural level, cultural level. Sorry, I've had too much caffeine. Um, but also at the product level. By like committing that R&D spend, and normally like CapEx, committing spend is the area where it's hardest to get companies to really do something. Um, and, I, and I think that we see that in a lot of products that are coming out now where companies are looking at, and you can see if you agree with this, uh, I think companies have looked at a lot of these things that they looked at previously as nice-to-haves or intangibles or these annoying costs, you know, potential cost centers where the past couple years, looking at how the state of employment and employ employability changed over the pandemic, when people were working remotely and people deciding uh, that they didn't necessarily have to be committed to a certain company or a certain location, that it, it brought this front and center for companies where they had to start concentrating on the intangibles because people started looking for the intangibles in their jobs, now feeling that they were freer to move to jobs that were more fulfilling or, you know, aligned better with their interests and so on. And so to me, it seems like a lot of that has finally filtered back to the employers where they realize that employees are an important resource, right? That keeping your employees happy or just, I mean, they're, them, you know, they're, they're, always, they're always happier if you pay them more, right? But I think sometimes if you, if you get them more fundamental ways in which they can be kept happy or kept fulfilled for the long term, it gets to a lot of these 
things that that tie into values, they tie into principles. Uh, and you know, a lot of what you're seeing with sustainability, DEI, uh, and ESG, it is in that direction. Uh, so it, it is an interesting trend to see, amongst others that we'll mention right. you know, shortly. And and we do want to talk about the economic impact of that because you know, in addition to just being good for the sake of being good and and being attractive to to customers and to employees, you know, we're now creating products that are more powerful or just as powerful, but using less power. Right. And that adds up. You know, when you have hundreds or thousands of laptops or compute sitting somewhere and you're using less power, um, the, the packaging is smaller, so you're saving on the packaging materials, which is good for the environment, but you're also increasing the amount of product per pallet, as we talked about before. And this, right. these are all turning into cash, especially in a recession. That it adds up. It's it it really has a, a, a long tail on it. It does, and I think uh, you know hard hard times are difficult times. You know, it's a double edged sword, and one in on one on one edge of that sword is clearly difficulty. You know, uh, challenging conditions. A reduced profitability and so on. But the other side of that sword is that it has to make you sharper, right? You have to execute better. It makes you concentrate on all the ways in which probably you were doing so great before in your existing business that you just ignored all the different areas where probably money was leaking out or you were not doing well or you were not taking care of your employees, for example. Uh, so I think that through every challenge, there's also the opportunity to to reinvigorate the company or to to rethink certain things, to become better, sharper, uh, better combatant as a competitor. So I think, you know, we're seeing that now where people are noticing, yes, we can do more sustainably. You know, we can also be better at packaging. We can be smarter at packaging. Uh, we can actually do both. We can, uh, we can create sustainable packaging and we can fit more pieces per container or we can spend less money on logistics on the weight of packaging, if we just get smarter about how we package products, keep it more compact, maybe reduce some of the excess, you know, glossy, fancy materials, but we, we stick to fundamentals, we make the packaging attractive, but we also make it uh, as small and as compact while still protective as possible. And also the, the, um, the products themselves have much more, a much higher quantity of recycled materials in there. You know, I know HP, uh, you know, announced their new monitor plastics, stand today yep. that, that are, you know, aluminum. The aluminum is from recycled aluminum cans. The plastics are from recycled plastics from a lot of manufacturers. So, so again, it, it looks like this is a trend as opposed to just being a buzzword that we've had in the past that companies are really taking seriously and employees and customers are taking seriously. Yeah, and I hope it continues into the future because, you know, we – Right now, we're in uncertain economic times, let's say, for the next year or two or undetermined amount of time. And so companies are trying to execute smarter, sharper, being more efficient. Um, will that change when good times come back and they're making money hand over fist? I hope not. Right. I hope that that, that type of cognizant, you know, uh, attention to things like, again, sustainability mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, power conservation and what and so on. I think that it's a question in my mind, but I'm hopeful that that doesn't go away, right? That that stays in their collective consciousness uh, into perpetuity, that that's just simply a part of the consumer electronics industry going forward. Fingers crossed that companies are doing things for the good of all mankind. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, one of the trends that I've been watching so far today is this concept of, of the importance of recurring revenue. Mm. And, you know, we understood... You know, for, for years, we were talking about this before, for years, you know, people were talking about cutting the cord, you know, not paying the cable bills anymore, Chris, so they're going to get everything over the top. Over the top is just as expensive now in terms of all the services that we have, you know. Uh, it, so, but, but it's extending past the things that we were expecting. It's now, you know, we were talking before, auto, automotive, automobile makers are now unbundling like airlines were, you know, you, they're charging you monthly for heated seats. Or it, is, I assume this is a trend that you've seen and that we're going to continue to see. Yes, uh, I have some, uh, quite a few interesting opinions on this, but, you know, I cover, as, as you probably know, like, you know, my shift over the past years, I, I've covered streaming services extensively and the, the uh, connected entertainment space. And, and it's been interesting looking at how that, whole business has changed over the past few years, especially, you know, being here at the show, you look at the Samsung, LG, a lot of the TV makers, um, 
you know, and they're, the new, and they're the new gatekeepers, by the way. Yes. If there's a platform Agreed. on there or not, you know, it's, it's no longer the MSOs. Now it's the – That's where they see the money. Members. And, you know, so I, my, my opinion has always been that whoever controls the final point of entertainment consumption, you know, who, who aggregates at that point, um, they're the ultimate gatekeeper. And so we see the TV business now being defined not by how many things you sell, right? I mean, it, it's still – that's a still an important factor, but – it's not the per unit revenue at the time of sale that really is the, the long money, right? The long money uh, for somebody like a Samsung or a Roku, um, you know, who sells the platform, right? They, they sell devices. Roku, for example, they don't, they're not really in as much of the device business anymore in terms of share of revenue that comes from devices versus platform licensing. But ultimately, you get long tail revenue from selling that measurement data, the advertising, you know, everything else that comes from having that presence on a device, because you control that operating system, right? It's your operating system. And so that's the long money in TVs. And, you know, we see shifts in power, even within advertising, right? The traditional heavyweights in advertising. um, And in measurement, they're now having to deal with the fact that you know, Samsung's ad business that they ad and measurement data business that they stood up, Vizio's and so on. They were also selling that glass level data to the Nielsen's of the world uh, because now that's almost the ground truth, right? To figure out what people are doing on that device, that TV, whether it's gaming, watching a video, watching YouTube, uh, and it's immensely powerful. But getting back to your example, I digressed for a bit. Uh, you look at recurring revenue. And so that, that's maybe what's taking place on the TV front. And if we think about, uh, you mentioned spending more on streaming. And my, my take on that is a little bit different in that we are spending more on streaming, but the, the psychological value is different, right? So if we think about, I'll take a 10-second tangent. You think about why people will pay more for Uber than a cab late at night, right? But it's because the experience is different or they're happy to not have the hassle of, you know, where's my cab? Oh, well, call us if it doesn't come in 30 minutes, right? You have the certainty of knowing where it is and if it's coming and how much it's going to cost at Uber. People, even paying more, there's more value to them in that experience that they're paying for. And so similarly, when we, when we bring this back to streaming, you think about the old experience of paying 100 something dollars a month for your cable TV or, you know, satellite TV subscription, and you got a couple hundred channels of stuff that you weren't interested in. Now, if you're spending, you know, your total bucket is totaling up to 80 bucks a month. Maybe you've got the MVPD like YouTube TV or you've got a couple other services in there. By and large, more, a higher percentage of that spend are things that you are self opting into, right? Like you decided you wanted it. You, you added that, you know, UFC fight pass and taste made. And I don't know. I'm trying to think of something else that's really random. Uh, I, I'm with the big guys. I'm with Disney and with Paramount and with Netflix and with the – Okay, you know, the, but, the, but the those are all guys. things that you, you wanted to watch, right? You know, maybe there's stuff in there that you still don't really like, but there's something on there that you do want, right? Mm-hmm. Like you want a Paramount because you are a huge Yellowstone fan or SEAL team or something like that. And then you got Netflix because of what they have. And so the psychological value of 100 bucks that you're spending on a $100 streaming bucket um, is higher, right? Your perceived value is higher – your emotional attachment to it is like, okay, I'm getting my money's worth. That's higher than the hundred bucks you were throwing at the cable company before, where you were getting a lot more fluff. And, and you got to multiply all your numbers by like two or three. You're not, you're not, <laughs> yeah. you're not where you need to be. But, but, but the, point, the point is, it makes sense. Yeah. So I, I spent too long in that. But, you know, if we think about automobiles, yes, it's very interesting to see that trend now where automakers, they're really going hard on economies of scale and manufacturing where they make only, you know, they make fewer variants with the hardware built in. And they just figure they're going to charge you subscription over time if you want a lot of those things turned on, right? Like the heated seats. Or maybe you want a better, you know, adaptive cruise control enabled, right? Or instead of a baseline cruise control. And so for them, they see the longer money in uh, – they don't see ultimately making greater revenue over the long term in selling you that option at the time of sale. Right, because of the amount of uh, back-end costing it, it takes to basically make multiple variants of a car or to order it, customize, to have it shipped. For them, they see the longer money and, okay, we just build two or three variants with everything in it. And long-term, because we know that once people turn on heated seats, they generally don't end the subscription because we charge a little bit per month or yearly, uh, that that long money is going to be larger. 
And so I, I think it is an interesting trend. It does it does feel very unfamiliar. It feels maybe not invasive. It feels I don't know. It feels uncomfortable now, maybe because it's so new. But the thought of paying extra to have something turned on and then to pay that in a monthly bill into perpetuity, it, it takes some getting used to. Well, it's it's interesting for us to talk about it because, you know, in our space, in the, in the commercial space, you know, we have that model with Tanberg going back years ago where they were one, one, uh, one thing and then you would be able to upgrade license keys and, and, and get the various features going that way. Um, we also had... Um, uh, that ability in, 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 in devices we put in the room, but we might want to be thinking more about that. You know, what can we unbundle? What can we do differently right. going forward with that? So um, it's definitely a trend to look at. Would you, I mean, uh, let me let me ask you a question. If we think about bundling and unbundling, uh, in the TV space, you know, one of the, the favorite things that analysts love to talk about over the last two or three years has been the industry pushed so hard to disaggregate, right, to break off all the certain services uh, from each other and to break them away from pay TV. And now the push is towards re-aggregation, right? Finding ways to bring it all together. Uh, so there's less uh, of consumers looking at six, seven, eight different builds and, you know, trying to uh, navigate through multiple different app experiences to find the content they want. You know, how do we super aggregate? Uh, but, but we see a return of bundling as part of that, right? People wanting to buy from, you know, from their, Internet service provider. Okay, I use so you're saying I can throw Netflix and these three other services into my subscription, um, and just it'll all be built. So rebundling at the edge, right? Rebundling on the billing side, right? So I I think that we're seeing a lot of the traditional ISP industry, telco industry, cable industry, etc., uh, finding ways to try and control more of that money coming through mm. by offering the ability to to bundle. Right, billing aggregation. So I, I think we're not done with the bundling trend yet. You know, will that cycle come back around and then people want to break everything apart again? Maybe. At one of the manufacturers' press conferences today, they made a very big deal about showing um, a wireless, a true wireless display. Yeah, yeah. A ninety, a ninety-inch, ninety-six inch, I could or somewhere in the nineties. Um, true wireless display and and a zero connectivity box that connects to it. You know, 4K stream, uh, 120 hertz refresh, yeah. that it would be convenient. And I'm trying to think, unless it's using one of those new standards of wireless power, it isn't really going to be wireless, is it? No. It's still got to have something behind it. Yeah, it's got to have a power source. I think it's got a rechargeable power source, if I recall. Really? Yeah. So it doesn't need a plug on it? Uh, I mean, it, I, 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 I don't think, because I don't think there's enough, the, at the state of wireless power, I don't think... It can transmit that wireless power as technology cannot transmit the amount of amperage needed to drive that size of an, set. An OLED set. Uh, yeah, I so agree. So if I recall, I think it's actually got a rechargeable power source. Either that, or it's got a plug behind it, and it just you don't need to run HDMI all over <laughs> the place, which yeah. is still a benefit. Yes. But you know, I I, I wonder if we're throwing around too many of these. Uh, you know, foldable, you know, no no wire, no contact, smart, you know, all these words that don't really mean very much to anybody. And then you actually look at the box and you're buying a display, which is essentially the same technology as you've had for the last, you know, five or ten years. Right. Um, I, I would say this is a bit of a tangent, but I think, you know, we see companies now looking for ways to really, really differentiate or add value to the basic proposition of a display. Right, and so in this case, it's making a "quote unquote" fully wireless display. Uh, I think you know if we look at the major CE manufacturers, we see a few different directions in which they're doing this. You know, one of which is is trying to get a little bit more integration with some of the collaboration and communication trends over the past couple of years. Right, so uh, revisiting the idea of an add-on camera to your smart TV, uh, so that you can do Zoom calls and so on. Uh, that was something where, you know, uh, for any of you viewers who have been around the industry long enough, if you recall, companies like Samsung and so on, years back, maybe de a decade back, uh, introducing the idea of attaching a camera to your TV or having a camera in the bezel, uh, but it never went anywhere. And now, you know, we see an environment where it's not just an interesting differentiation to throw onto a major brand TV, uh, but it's also something where they feel that consumers are now 
seasoned enough at the prospect of having a camera around every day from you know the prodigious use of cameras to communicate over the past two or three years to where maybe it will fly this time. Uh, but you know we, we see that also on monitors. Uh, and I think beyond the camera part, you know we see the major CE manufacturers now using audio as a dimension uh, that they're adding or concentrating on in their marquee smart TVs as a way to differentiate above what's an increasingly commoditized product, the display or the smart TV. And, and in the enterprise space, you're starting to see some technology enhancements, um, some that in processing, in audio processing and video processing. Um, in audio processing, we were talking about before, there are some people here that are talking about how they can figure out how to make it more directional. Yes. The sound that passes through the microphone will be picked up, but the sound that's coming from the sides won't. In video, pro and that's just a technology. I haven't seen that in any products. But I have seen announced in products, also in HP's products this year, that we're now processing out gaze angle issues. That cameras that are off gaze are now somehow going to automatically process and make it look at least a little closer, right. like, you're, like, like you're looking into the camera. Because, you know, the question comes up on on social media um, at least once a week where somebody says, where's the right place to put a camera? And, you know, that answer hasn't changed for both of our entire <laughs> careers. The right place to put the camera is at the eye level of the person talking. Um, so if we've been able to get technology to fix that, that would be a major plus ahead. And it is. You know, you see so much more intelligence going into it. I think, you know, uh, just, to, just to quickly comment on that audio angle, uh, if we look at, Intelligence being used, I'll use Samsung as an example because they probably put the most R&D behind it, uh, to where in video processing, they're figuring out, you know, uh, different areas of the picture to, uh, to concentrate on based on what's happening in the picture and the type of content it is, right? Uh, whether it's action or it's, you know, something cinematic and figuring out selectively what areas of the picture to enhance. And then also with the audio, uh, figuring out directionally where it looks like that audio is coming from on the screen, right? Using, you know, some processing there and then placing that audio in relative, you know, space, right from left to right and up and down based on the speaker array that they have around the screen. And, you know, it's, it's just interesting that they're using so much weight behind audio now as a key differentiator to what they sure. offer in a TV, right? In a display. Uh, so, you know, I think that it's, a, it's the start of, Something that we're going to see continuing is that, you know, the experience of consuming entertainment is something more than just a picture, right? And I think, you know, we look at the, the experience of communications as something more than just receiving a picture of people talking. It's, it carries much more weight when the frame is centered, right? When it's adjusted to make it look like the person is looking at the camera, right? It carries much more impact. And, and it's also, as we were talking about before, you know, coming full circle to um, ESG, is, you know, there, there's an accessibility element to this. I saw a speaker yesterday, very pricey speaker, but a speaker yesterday <laughs> where they talked about, you know, curving the transducer was, was actually focusing the audio more on the frequencies that are in normal speech. Right. So that, that you have, you know, the over-the-counter um, uh, um, hearing aids are now, you know, we've seen them for a number of years, but, you know, now, now they're really starting to become very popular, um, which is great. So you don't no longer need a prescription to get a hearing aid. Um, so we're going to start to see some more technology built specifically for accessibility. Um, there was one that, that I saw this morning um, about a, a portable device for the, the, the visually impaired that, that converts things into Braille. There are glasses now that do closed captioning. Um, so, you know, a lot of the the tools that we were thinking, you know, AR, VR, AR, VR missed its exit. You know, if it couldn't, if you, if it couldn't get um, um, mass uh, consumption during a pandemic when we're all locked down, forget it. There's not going to be mass <laughs> consumption. But these these niche situations for telehealth, for surgery, um, for for accessibility support, that's where we're going to really start to see some of these products take off and hopefully be, you know, uh, reasonably priced or covered by insurance or something. So. It's an exciting time to be in this space. It is, it is. And I think uh, you bring up a good point in which we see a lot of these uh, classic consumer electronics companies now getting more involved in health tech, uh, med tech and health tech. And, you know, now it's gone beyond just smart watches, right, or watches that, that take your temperature and your pulse. Uh, to, we're seeing more fused analysis, right, looking at what might be heart arrhythmias. Uh, you know, Samsung, you know, having a camera on their TV and probably not the first uh, of the manufacturers where they have a health app on the TV now. And in their case, 
it is analyzing what's being seen through the camera, right, computer vision, to detect maybe uh, changes in I, they haven't really talked about what their factors are that it perceives when it looks at, uh, uh, you know, what your heart rate is and so on from the camera. And whether it's looking at how, you know, the lividity of your face or other factors, uh, just that, it's impressive the amount of effort that's being put behind from a lot of different CE manufacturers in personal health. Okay, and also, you know, med tech and the over-the-counter hearing aids, you know, effort is fascinating too and I think it's great for everybody personally you know from uh, making the uh, making hearing assistance more accessible for, on a cost basis to people but just on an availability basis and HP is product. working with uh, new Hero on that to, uh, to have the new products come out so that's really nice Paul how can people get in touch with you if they want to uh, work with you or find out more about what you do I'm glad you asked uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn by just looking up you know Paul Erickson from Austin Texas which is where I live uh, but also, uh, you can also go directly to my website, which is ericksoninsights.com, and that'll tell you about everything I do uh, related to strategy, consultation, and industry analysis, and so on when it comes to media and entertainment tech uh, and consumer tech. So I know I've grabbed you between press conferences, and I appreciate you coming to take the time to talk with our viewers. Thanks, Thanks for having me. For coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take we'll care. stay in touch. And hopefully after the show, let's chat again and see if any of what we talked about are right or wrong, or if we found any gems that we, uh, we weren't expecting to see when we go over to Eureka Park. Let's do, and perhaps we will revisit some of our themes at ISC time. Absolutely. So. Are you going to Barcelona? Yes, I am. I'll see you in Barcelona. <laughs> see I'll you see there. you guys in Barcelona, too. Take Thanks care. Thanks a lot.